Welcome back to Modern Education. I am the host of Modern Education, Benjamin S. Woodford, here in the studio with my co-host once again. Hi, this is Emily Quiles in the studio. And we also have an esteemed guest that we are very excited to talk with uh, today. So we'll bring her on the mic in just a couple of minutes. Emily, how are you today? Are you excited to be on the air again? Oh, I'm doing great. Really? Despite the minor flu, I feel like I'm coming down with. I don't. I don't know. It's. But I've been working with kids, and you know uh, how that yeah, is. Yeah. They are, <laughs> they they're snot their factories, right? Yeah, I think they are. I mean, not that we have anything against snot factories, because this is America, and we live off of factory <laughs> production. I don't know what I'm doing here. Okay. Tangent. I, I have gone on a tangent in the first thirty seconds of modern education today. This is a new record, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Emily, uh, while yes. I run in there to the studio with you, do, would you like to just get us started and tell us what we're going to be doing today, who we'll be talking to? Yes, so we are talking with Esther. She is an educator, journalist, author, and mother of three very impressive daughters. One is a chief executive at 23andMe, CEO of YouTube, and anthropologist. Esther also leads the Media Art Center at Palo Alto High School, and it has been nicknamed the grandmother of Silicon Valley. It's actually the godmother. That's the godmother. <laughs> there we go. So we have the godmother in the studio of this area. I, I'm i very excited about this interview with you here today. Um, and I have to say, because I did not pronounce, I didn't try to pronounce your last name right now because I'm a little bit, in, I don't know how to say can it. Help, can you help so us can you with please your last tell name, us? Yes. It's actually real easy to remember. Um, if you've ever gone jet skiing. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done that? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's great. Because it's whoa jet ski. Okay. Whoa jet ski. Whoa jet okay. Ski. Yeah. And your, your students. I definitely have, <laughs> overcomplicated that. <laughs> your, your students have a nickname for you, don't they? Oh yeah, they call me Wadge. Wadge. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I think the whole city does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well beyond, I think your your message has made it well beyond the city, and lots of people I think are familiar with your work and really excited about the ways and messages you bring. And I'm one of them actually. I started reading your book since we last talked, <sighs> and oh my gosh, I. I think I only made it about halfway through the book this morning, but I have so many quotes of things I want to talk to you about and so many just ways you see and talk about and think about students and parenting that are just mm -hmm. so inspiring and really uh, relatable. And I think even um, attainable for people that are reading it, which is a really nice feature that I was noticing. That's great, because that was my goal, to make it attainable. Right. Something you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think it's really easy to say, hey, everyone wants to raise good kids and have them be successful, but laying out some very you know clear and easy to follow guidelines seem to make such a big difference, and you, I think, do that really well. So you wrote the book. Uh, what's the name of your book? How to Raise Successful People, Simple Lessons for Radical Results. Oh. Right, right. So how to be successful lessons? people, simple lessons for for radical results, which is such really a really simple. Yeah, can you come a little closer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay. So I just want to jump right in, if that's okay with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Emily, take the mic for a second. I'm going to fix this up. Yeah. Well, so, but I'm. The, 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 we are here in the studio. <laughs> Sorry, that was bad, Emily. But uh, so we have we have two books that from. Uh, sir, 2014 and 2019. So 2019 was the one that we were just talking about, how to raise successful people. Um, and the first one that you have, Moon Shops in Education. And so that one also explores kind of the digital and online learning in classrooms, which you also practice in Palo Alto High School. That's right. That's It was essentially, the first one was a guide for teachers mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how to do it. <clears throat> the second one is a guide for parents and teachers and industry on how to do it. 
And you have your your work has really permeated well beyond the classroom, right? You you've coached yes. with different companies and all kinds of corporate entities trying to implement these same strategies because they're really about creating successful people, which is what everybody wants to do. Right. So it goes beyond the classroom to the real world. And right. So everybody needs to realize that that you know education doesn't stop when you graduate from high school. It actually starts when you graduate. Right. Right. Oh. And I, I actually. I'm looking for the quote right now. You had a quote, something to that effect about people think that, yay, I graduated, so I'm done with learning, Mm -hmm. right? Right. And my understanding is that the entire point of schooling is really to create a love and ability to learn on your own, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a teach you how to learn on your own, by the way. Exactly. Teacher there. Exactly. Yeah. Teachers are very helpful, but I'd say it's almost crippling if you always need a teacher every time you want to learn anything. Exactly. The independence. But I also think one thing that's really interesting that you put in of just exploring the idea of putting multimedia and the tools so then we can be able to function in this new world. Right. Well, multimedia helps us all function really well, right? Because, you know, if you want to find out something, you go to Google Mm -hmm. or you go, you know, on YouTube and get a video about how to do it. I mean, I'm doing that all the time, even for stuff around the house, you know, so like how to change a washer in your dryer. So they even have the specific washer there. Someone has done it. Yes. I was like, Thank you so much. You, right. <laughs> I always do that. I will type something like sometimes it makes no sense in a question, but someone's asked it pretty much in the same form and there's an answer. Right. It's really impressive. It is really impressive. So you can get a lot of information online and you know that website, I think it's called Quora. Q-U-A- mm-hmm. Quora, yeah, yeah. Quora. The most unusual questions. Really? <laughs> yeah. Never, it's like addicting. <laughs> you know, you're like, I never thought about that. And then you want to read it. Then you want to read the next one. And so it's like, oh, no, 10 minutes. No, it's been an hour. Yeah. <laughs> well, this this love you have for learning has really been a lifelong thing, right? When you were in, I think, elementary school, you had uh, an award for reading the most books at the library. Wow. That's right. Yes. And I'm so proud of myself. I, and, you know, it's amazing what I did to get that star. Yeah. Like a little star that they pasted on a certificate. Right, right. But it meant something because of the work that you put into it, not because of the star itself. Right. right, right. Now, I have always thought, and or maybe not always, but I've long thought that reading is one of these lifelong goals that should be central to everybody. Mm-hmm. And you obviously picked that up really early. Do you have any insight as to how or what kind of things led you in that direction or maybe even how parents could help facilitate that for their kids? Well, I was passionate about making sure that I understood my world and how I should best navigate that world. And um, back in the old days, well, actually, we still have it here at Stanford, the stacks, right? The library. So I, I used stacks, to, yeah. I know, <laughs> I would just hang out there. And what is so exciting, because you just walk down you know, the aisle, books on both sides and mm-hmm. you know, just pick something that looks interesting. And so, I mean, I could spend a whole afternoon there just looking at them and then, you know, you can look at it, put it back and take another one, put it back. <laughs> and yeah. so I, I, it was really entertaining. That's my main thing. And at the same time, people always thought, oh, she's doing a lot of reading. That's really good. So in addition to being entertained, I was also being you know, applauded. It's like, Mm. thank you. (laughs) Yeah. So you knew you were doing something good. (laughs) Well, yes, at least in the eyes of the world. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. And that that little bit of recognition can go a long way, right? I I think this is a a theme that came up a couple of times in your book is this idea of a single teacher or a parent, someone taking an interest in something you're doing can make such a huge difference. That's right. And that's why I'd like to encourage all teachers, Mm -hmm. you know, to treat the students with kindness. That's the end of that acronym I have. Oh, yeah. We'll we'll go through that acronym in a second because we haven't really covered it yet. Because, you know, It makes a huge difference to students when people believe in them, because then it's interesting. They believe in themselves. When Mm -hmm. somebody else thinks you're great, you're like, oh, well, maybe I am pretty good, you know, and and maybe I'm good at doing whatever it is, X or Y. And uh, I'll persist because, you know, someone said I was really good at it, so I'm going to work on it. Mm -hmm. And that's where the grit comes from. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's lay out this acronym that you you stick with through the book, because I really love it. And it's nice and clean and um, it gets the trick done. Right. (laughs) So the acronym is trick. That's (laughs) trust, respect, independence, 
collaboration and kindness. That's right. Okay. So maybe you could tell us, uh, where, did this thing kind of emerge over many years or did you sit down one day and figure out this acronym or how did this come into being part of your framework? Well, I'll tell you, it uh, took a long time. Okay. I, it wasn't just there one day. Sure. Um, cause what happened is I was trying to figure out you know, what I had done with my students and my classes, well, they all seemed to want to take the class. The classes kept growing in number. Sure. And I just like, what am I doing this different? And I didn't know because, you know, a lot of people, you don't know what you do that, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes either makes people happy or sad. One of the two. And so I asked my students, like, what's so great about this class? Honestly, you know, <laughs> really. And yeah. I kept and for a couple of years in a row, I got the same answer and I figured, well, they weren't collaborating. So that must be true. And the answer was, you trust us. Wow. wow. And I was like, well, wow. just the that, I, you know, I just rejected that. There must be something else. Is it the pizza from last Friday? <laughs> <laughs> It never hurts, but yeah, yeah. pizza never hurts for a kid's you can't heart. I love pizza, but you can sure get a few extra points along the way. I think that's true. So anyway, after hearing it a few times in a few mm. years, I realized that that must be it. Yeah, it's trust, and the, and then I looked at what I was doing, and I realized that I was trusting them a lot more than other teachers were doing, mm. and that gave them a sense of confidence. Yeah, and then after that, I put together the respect because they also said, mm. you know, you respect our ideas, and some of those ideas are a little out there. <laughs> and, sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> and so, nevertheless, I was like, well, you know, they're not going to hurt anything, so why don't we go? with whatever an idea it is that, you know, you've come up with. And um, so I think trust and respect. And then the other three that I came up with, they were just all part of it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you trust somebody and respect them, you give them independence. Mm -hmm. And you let them do things that they care about and then bring it together. And then C for collaboration. We all work as a team, you know, as a newspaper or a magazine or television or whatever. You can't do it yourself. You need to have a group. And that's true for every area of life. You try to do it alone and you're not going to get very far. That's right. And I like that you have that together, independence and collective. Right. Collaboration. Collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Or collaboration. And apologize. then also, and then kindness, because the reason I put kindness in there, it's so important in every aspect of life because we all make mistakes all the time. Mm-hmm. And so you have to treat first yourself with kindness. You have to forgive yourself Mm. because sometimes we do things that we regret and then we get really mad at ourselves and then you can't sleep. Right. Mm. And you're like, Oh, why did I ever do that? And and you have to, you know, let up on yourself and treat yourself with kindness Mm -hmm. and treat, you know, situations, whatever, especially in school. I mean, let's face it. School is a place to make mistakes. That's how you learn. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you don't make mistakes, well, clearly you're not learning because, you know. Right, right. No one does it perfect to start. Yeah. And if you're getting all the answers right, right off the bat, it just means that the challenge isn't hard enough. It doesn't mean that you're smart or capable. You're just not being challenged. That's right. You're not being Mm -hmm. challenged. Right. So, um, so that's why I think kindness works in all areas, um, because sometimes kids make mistakes that aren't just necessarily related to the schoolwork, you know, maybe, sure. you know, they were nasty to somebody and, you know, you know, forgiving is really part of the whole thing, mm-hmm. being right. able to forgive other people. Because if you think about it, the person who gets hurt the most whenever there's anger is the one who holds the anger. Sure, sure. It's a self debilitating process to hold on to those, those grudges and that anger just sort of, it sours you, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you guys are too young, but let me tell you, it gives you high blood pressure. That is and something to, avoid to the think high blood about. Pressure. It's really hard Enjoy, to, to avoid anger because of the threat of high blood pressure later in life, though. I like I, I like focusing on the effects of it has on you right in the moment, too. But yeah, yeah. But um, it is also considering the long term. It's sure, not sure, worth it. sure. Absolutely. I just have a hard time getting that message across to my teenagers. <laughs> yeah, <know>. definitely. <laughs> well, you don't. Right. They'll never want to worry about the high blood pressure. But let's see. There could be other nasty repercussions of sure, anger. Sure. I really love this. How you how you say like okay trust and respect is kind of the baseline of how you start and then the the last three or or four there 
Three. Three. Yeah, I can count. I have a degree in math. I think I can do that <laughs> once in a while. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really about how to implement these things. Trust mm-hmm. and respect are shown through giving people independence and working together and forgiveness, kindness, this kind of thing. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, my advisor here at Stanford, uh, Joe Bowler, has this, this saying that she always uses, which is um, mistakes are expected, respected, and inspected. Mm. And it's, yeah, it's great. great. It's yeah. really fun, right? And I used yeah. to go through this at the beginning of my school years with my students and just talk to them about how, what does that mean to expect mistakes, respect mistakes, inspect mistakes? And the one that always stuck sticks with me is the respect. Mm-hmm. And it, they would always come up with that. It means both respecting yourself when you make mistakes and respecting other people. And I think that's that really, really important. Saying, yeah. But also when you make a mistake, usually it's because you're taking a risk and exactly. you're trying something creative. So you don't want to get mad about that. You don't want to disrespect the person. Right. Because they tried something and it didn't work. Or yourself. Either. Or yourself. Yeah. Well, especially yourself. Right. And it's really important. And I think that's what's happening with the parenting crisis these days mm-hmm. is that they don't trust themselves. You know, they're worried that, mm-hmm. you know, so they're constantly doing research, constantly looking at the child on the left and then the right. And that's like, Mm -hmm. oh, no, Um, my son is not yet toilet trained and he's three. That means, you know, won't get into Stanford. No. Right, right, right. (laughs) Well, yeah, you have a quote. You have a quote that I pulled out from your book here that goes right along those lines that I wanted to just throw in. It's Mm -hmm. like you said that we are the ones who are creating this frantic, overly competitive world for Mm -hmm. our kids. In truth, parenting is quite simple. Um, and you're, and you go on and talk right. about your method and everything. But that's I think, right. I think that's a really powerful statement about, you know, I mean, the, the suicides going on with mm-hmm. kids in Palo Alto who are just sort of overachieving as a, as a way of life and just the realization that parents have a huge bearing on that, right? They are yeah. creating this environment. They are the ones putting these pressures on their kids. Right. You know, what is interesting for them to know, parents to know, is that you don't have to say it in order for the kids to feel it. Mm. Yeah. You know, you, Show it. there's yeah. always a sixth sense yeah. mm-hmm. and, you know, they know when you're stressed, um, they grew up with you, right? So mm-hmm. They know you. Yeah. And so even if you're not talking about it, they feel it. And so puts a lot of pressure on them. Mm-hmm. So I think one thing is, you know, no matter where you go to college, it's not the name of the college that matters. It's how you did at the school that matters. Mm. The kinds of re- relationships you made, what you learned. I mean, you can learn the same thing at a school without a big name. And you can do, in some cases, better. Because all the research shows that if you're a big fish in a little pond, you do better than being a big, a little fish in a big pond. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and there's, yeah, there is a lot of, uh, I'd say, evidence and anecdotes out there talking about how much more attention and and access to your professors you could get at like a small, uh, mm-hmm. maybe a, a small liberal arts college or something like along those lines. And yet at the same time, just to kind of like throw in both sides of the coin is there is at some level a higher expected value for a degree at a place like Stanford, which is why people fight so much to get into these places. Right. But it has so really, like right, right. <laughs> yeah, but it also has very little to do with the yeah. amount of education you're going to get or the learning that comes out of that. And I agree with you that uh, learning should be the goal of what we're doing in education overall, even if this mm-hmm. kind of credentialism piece sort of always muddies the waters for us. Mm-hmm. But in general, I think you will, at most cases, get a better experience and a better education at a smaller, more um, in intuitive college where they're really connected to their students. Right. Where they really value the students and they have more time to talk to them. And um, so I think it's great to go to Stanford. So one of my daughters went to Stanford. So Mm -hmm. I and of course, I am here at Stanford too in the media right. X department. Mm-hmm. So, um, of course, I, I'm here because I think it's great. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I also have a degree from San Jose State. Yeah. And that was a great experience there too. And so, you know, I think we ought to look around and see that a lot of colleges offer you a lot of opportunities. And mm-hmm. it's not just one place. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Because, um, 
one thing that Stanford does offer is the social capital of being here with people that are going to be leaders in the future. But on the other hand, so I'm giving you both sides here. Yeah. Other hand, if you look at the CEOs of the uh, Fortune 500 companies, the top people, very few have degrees from Ivy League schools. Right, Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. I think that is something that is uh, pretty well established across the board is that it doesn't necessarily make you the top just because you went to the top school. And it's Mm -hmm. almost, um, I would say there's even a certain level of people are looking for a safe route and that's why they go to top schools like this. Right. And you don't really make it, you don't make it to the top by looking for the safe way through. You make it by making mistakes and taking risks Mm -hmm. and really being able to push yourself, right? Right. Well, also, I say that the most important skills for the 21st century, I call them the four C's. Mm-hmm. And sounds like a hotel. but it's <laughs> That's the four <laughs> seasons, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Well, this is the four <laughs> C's. <laughs> and it's number one is communication skills. Okay. And yeah. Communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. Those yeah. are the four C's. And those are the four things that you need to have in order to succeed, I think, in the 21st century. And it can come from any um, any school. Mm-hmm. You don't have to get it from an Ivy League school. Sure. And I think a lot of that also maybe comes from parents. I mean, these are sort of foundational skills that you should be learning you know, throughout childhood and throughout your socialization process, not just when they finally get to your class, right? Right. I mean, I'm sure you do your best at any age that you bring them in, but... We count on the parents, right? Right. We count on the parents. The parents are the child's first teacher. And parents don't think of themselves like that. So that was one of the goals of this book. Mm -hmm. I want the parents to think of themselves as the child's first teacher and the most influential teacher that they'll ever have. Mm -hmm. And I've heard in the past many times people say, oh, I'll wait till he gets to school to learn that. Right. You know, it's like, what? (laughs) <laughs> You're the teacher. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And it's, it's, I think, um, I think there's a real disconnect in our society around this because at some level, the parent is the primary first and best teacher the student will ever have. Right. But then on the other hand, the, the school system is essentially set up to supplement that parenting job. People don't have time to parent 24 hours a day. They can't, have, they can't afford to stay home and be single, single, uh, family income or single income families anymore. Mm-hmm. And so the school really is part of the parenting apparatus. They're partners and they should see themselves as partners. So the school takes over when the parents are, you know, at work and when the kid is five years old and they should work together as a team, it should not be adversarial. And in many cases, there's a lot of, um, Teachers feel under attack, let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. And I think, I don't know a single person that went into teaching who did not want to make a positive impact on the lives of students. So they all go in with great aspirations. And then uh, somehow in the system, they are um, treated in a way that is disrespectful. And so then, by, I don't know if you know the statistic, but 50% of teachers quit after year five. Yeah. I I am sad to say I'm part of that statistic. I quit after my fourth year in the classroom and now I'm, you know, back here still working in education, but it's a hard job with not the kind of, you know, social capital and recognition Mm -hmm. that should go along with such a a servant oriented position. That's right. So that's, so you're one of, so you understand. And the only reason I continue to stay in the classroom, you know, because I've been there for um, 36 years. Um, I'm bowing down to her. I can't see see this on the radio, but it is actually physically happening. (laughs) Well, there's one, two reasons. One is because I didn't need the income because my husband's a professor of physics here at Stanford. Sure. And so it was supplemental income. And so I could have like walked away anytime I wanted to. So So there's no pressure financially that you have to be there. That's right. There was no financial pressure that I had to be there. Mm -hmm. So I was willing at that point to take risk, you know, and change the way that I was teaching to make it more meaningful for the students and for me. Mm -hmm. Most teachers don't have that option. Well, I'm going to give a quote from your kids here in forward to your book. They said our mother's mantra was always, if you don't speak up, 
speak out or complain, then the exact same thing is going to happen to someone else. That's absolutely right. That was and it's, always it's, my... Yeah. And it's so beautiful. And I, and I think it's, it's at least worth for us noting that you are coming in a place where you have a, a second income, that this is supplemental, and it gives you a lot of freedom to, to take these kinds of things on. And that's not true for everybody, right? I mean, some people don't have the time or energy or even capacity through working three jobs and just trying to survive. Right. And so we may all believe the same thing or want to believe that the same way you do, but not everybody has that kind of freedom. And so it sounds mm-hmm. like you were really in a position where you could pursue this kind of uh, ethic and way of seeing the world and putting your time and energy into exactly what you believe, which That's is right. I beautiful. Was very lucky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So would you say that as a <clears throat> teacher, is it just the financial burden that can be the reason why that's the statistics of five years and teachers drop out? Or would you say there's other no, factors there? I think there? the number one cause is lack of respect. Respect. Yeah. And, um, respect and comes all these circle. rules and regulations and people complaining all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think if there were more respect and teachers had more agency in the classroom and could teach in ways that they thought were more effective, mm-hmm. they wouldn't quit. Um, of course, the salary is part of the problem because, you know, it's hard to live in the Bay Area. Um, yeah. Yeah. On a teacher's salary, actually, it's kind of a joke. But um, a lot of people start out, you know, they're single and young, and so they can do it. But after a while, you know, they might want to have a family or might actually want to have a house. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And they can't do that on a teacher's salary. Right. And if you just think about it long term, a teacher affects eternity. Mm-hmm. And so we should be... We should be doing more to help our teachers be effective and stay in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard the term and I think this is more referred to in the medical literature, but the term moral injury, I think, is a good one for me. It mm-hmm. applies in this in this area as well. And it's the concept of, you know, when, when you apply to to medical profession, doctors being put on 15 minute time chunks and not being able to spend the actual time their patients need and not being able to prescribe things that are, you know, proactive or preventative and being sort of forced after years of of trying to get into medical field and all these things. And then they're essentially put in a position where they're not able to serve their, uh, their patients in the way they want. Mm -hmm. And it it can be a huge source of burnout, which is really just kind of this process of putting it on the doctor saying they're not good enough. And I think the same thing, this moral injury, I think is really prevalent in, in teaching. Yeah, it's, it's very similar. And especially with doctors, so sad because they spend so much time and cost so much money. And then if they don't have a feel like they have a satisfying career where they're actually helping people and being able to spend the time they need in that consultation, it's really counterproductive. It's, yeah. uh, you know, then you ask yourself, like, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. And I think it's the same for teachers. It's like, why am I doing this? There must be a an easier, more um, satisfying way to earn a living. Right, right. And and there are lots because teachers are hardworking, organized, thoughtful people who can work Good well skills. with others. And exactly. I mean, there are so many transferable skills that you can learn in the classroom that I think it's it's truly underwhelming or overwhelming. I don't know. There is a whelming going on around how much <laughs> teachers are underappreciated yeah. in society, given just the, the wealth of skills and coordination that they put out every day just to run a classroom. Yeah, I mean, right. think about trying to manage a 150 teenagers. I don't know too many parents who can handle their two kids well, right? <laughs> can you yeah. believe that? It's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. You know. To manage 150 teenagers, your uh, aspirations probably all go down. <laughs> Fortunately, most of the time, the classes are divided into 30, so it's five classes. Okay, sure. But in my case, I have like 60 kids at once, but oh, fortunately, wow. I do have a co-teacher, Rod Satterweight, and wow. um, thank God for him. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I wanted to talk, uh, kind of going back to what we were talking about before, for, but this idea of respecting your students, and I'm imagining there are probably lots of ways you show respect. Um, you know, when I was a teacher, I gave my students a lot of freedoms, which were very simple things. Like I didn't act, make them ask to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And something that simple, they could just sign out and leave. And no one ever had to ask. Nobody ever had to wonder if it was okay. And I feel like just little things like that go a, lot, a long way to send the message of you are trusted, you are autonomous, you can make your own decisions. I mean, it was something that simple. It seems like yeah. just obvious. But I'm wondering if you have some some key things that you do or sort of patterns that you found really work well to communicate that message? Well, I think you just pointed out one mm-hmm. that is really important because, I mean, can you imagine 
if you were at work and you have to raise your hand around the table. Oh, sorry, I have to go to the bathroom. Tell the whole room what you're doing. Tell the whole room, yeah. 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 Um, (laughs) And that's what they have to do in school. It's demoralizing. It's insulting. It's embarrassing. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. I I always said that's not something I'm ever going to do in my classroom because it's just sad. Why would you do that to people? Right. So that's one. Another thing that I've done, and I do all the time, actually, the kids take role. So Mm. we rotate it. And then, of course, the teacher checks it over, but the kids are in charge of doing that. And with a class of 60, there's a lot of role taking. Sure. Yeah. And so that gives whoever's in charge of the role that day a real sense of that we trust you. Yeah. And um, and it, it sends a message to the whole class that, you know, this teacher trusts the students. Yeah. And that's what you want to do uh, right away. Then I mean, there's much more substantial stuff they do, like they plan the class period. Mm -hmm. They actually run the class period, which is very unusual. But some of the I've had visitors who've come in and said things like, well, how how did they make that PowerPoint like that? How how did they do that? (laughs) With a computer. (laughs) Let me tell you, they're better than I am. (laughs) Yes. So they're impressive. It goes a long way. It goes a long way. But then, so I'm trusting them not only to come up with the ideas, make the presentation, and then presented in class. So you can imagine all the trust that's going on in that. Sure. And that's that's why the kids feel empowered. Yeah. And it's actually not just in my class, it's in all the journalism classes at mm. the Media Arts Center. I'm sure you have a hand in why how that's permeated the whole center, right? I think I might have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're making me Look feel really me. validated here because I used to do a lot of the same stuff. I let my students take role and I would just have them come over and give a little report so that I could hit the final yes on the ro- roll button. Like everybody knew that it, like they had roles in the classroom yeah. and something to do. And I'm like, wow, a super teacher did this too. So I'm, yeah. I'm okay. Right? Yeah, you did a great job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. The idea is we need to share that with all teachers. Oh, that's yeah. why you're here. That's why you're here. <laughs> yeah. So I've, that makes your life easier too, because they take role, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. say, it makes your life easier. It makes theirs empowered. Um, but I wanted to comment almost on the idea because I work at a preschool and we do similar things where we give tasks to the children and it actually gets like not just that student to pay attention, but everyone else because like, oh, I want to do that. Oh, well, if you want to do this, you have to pay attention. And giving a child a role, I feel like you see that a little bit more in elementary than high school, which is kind of sad because it seems a bit reverse where maybe giving a child more roles, I don't know. Are you saying you that? See, do you get are you I'm saying, saying that children can handle, or young people can handle, responsibility all the way through their entire learning? Well, they career? should be. Wow. But what I see, what e- I feel like es- I Esther's see, Esther's nodding her head in agreement. <laughs> we have we have consensus here. Kids okay, can good, do good. things at every level of their development. Yeah. Wow. But it's just sad because I feel like you see it less as they get older. They're super smart and very uh-huh. powerful. Yeah. So just think about it. If you learn a language, two languages from the zero to five. You can be fluent. You can learn three languages, just mm-hmm. like I lived in Switzerland. They speak German, French, and um, Italian. A lot of kids speak three languages. They're five years old. Wow. So, yeah. I mean, we can't do it easily. Adults have a really hard time. So little kids have a lot of facilities that we are not taking advantage of. Yeah. And also, I don't know anybody that's an Olympic anything who didn't start doing it when they were a child. They're really young. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and there's a lot of uh, research around expertise being, you know, this 10,000 hour mark. And, you know, there's this, this concept when you get out of college, you're supposed to be ready to start a career. But the reality is people are getting out of college and they still don't know anything. They just have this sort of generalized knowledge that they've been through school and hopefully learned some things. Mm -hmm. That's right. They don't know what they learned. Right, right. Exactly. Because they memorized it all and then afterward they forgot it. Right. But then the counterpoint (laughs) to that is people, you know, like Olympic athletes, they get to 22 years old and they are an expert with 10,000 hours of expertise and they really are at the top of their class. And uh, there was a, a book, I think it was a, I mean, not Dan Pink or... 
anyway, one of these popular art uh, authors that came up with this idea that most of the really powerful people that are really doing great things like Steve Jobs and all these other you know icons in Silicon Valley, most of them had a real competitive advantage where they started much earlier getting oh, access. Right. I mean, yes. Bill Gates, I think, had you know thousands of hours on the first computer ever because he just happened to live next to a college where it was accessible to him. Mm, right. And mm-hmm. it creates this this expertise at a very young age that we're not really giving in school. No, that's because we're controlling everything and we're passing down the same thing through our textbooks. Right. You know, so the textbooks, they say, oh, well, we're a revolutionary school. We don't have textbooks anymore. But guess what? They're all online. The same textbook is right. now the platform is different. Yeah. Sure, sure. So the methodology hasn't changed. So we need to remember that you don't get to be creative by listening to a lecture about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no one can lecture you how to be creative, right? Yes. <laughs> and I think there's a really important piece of this, which I know has been uh, very central for your life from a very young age. And I'm going to kind of dive into one of these personal stories from your book. But it was around um, something that happened with your brother. And it really spoke to you of the importance of taking independence and making some of your own decisions along the way. I mean, is it okay to relay that story for us? So, yeah, it's in the book and Mm -hmm. it's the story of my brother, David, who was playing on the kitchen floor with a bottle of aspirin. He was 18 months old and he opened them and then ate them. So Mm -hmm. clearly his taste buds were not yet developed. And um, then my mom didn't know what to do. She was being a young immigrant and, you know, she came to this country and she was just wowed by everything. Everybody knew more than she did. The country was amazing and all that stuff. So she called the doctor and asked, like, so what should I do? And clearly he wasn't thinking because he said, um, put him to bed and see how he is in a couple of hours. Mm. Well, so anybody who thinks knows that, you know, if you ingest a poison, you don't sit around for two hours and wait to see how you're going to be. So, of course, in two hours, he was violently ill. Um, then they took him to a community hospital where they pumped his stomach. And then he needed more care. But um, we didn't have proof of payment. So none of the subsequent hospitals we went to would take him. Mm. Um, so finally, the fourth hospital took him. But then at that point, he was already it was too late and he died, wow. which is really mm-hmm. a sad story, mm-hmm. tragic story for my family, for my mom, especially. Yeah. And um, so what happened is it taught me that um, never to believe people, no matter how long their titles were. Yeah. <laughs> and always to believe more in myself and my own gut reactions and to challenge authority. Because if she just would have challenged it and thought for herself, um, you know, that never would have happened. Yeah. But, you know, we all have this ultra respect for people with long titles yeah. and frequently they may also make state mistakes. They're human, you know? So that, that, you know, I was a 10 year old kid, so I wasn't saying this as a 10 year old kid. It was just, you know, it was all of a sudden my gut reaction was, I'm going to check and see if what you say is true. Mm-hmm. And so I spent a lot of time doing that. And then that was, I think, what propelled me in the education space to say, oh, my God, this doesn't work. Mm-hmm. You know, and I see all these people doing this, teaching this way. And, you know, the students are they're brain dead after a year with you. Yeah. So um, so then I changed. I, I challenged the system. I didn't do it over. And I mean, I didn't go and tell all the other teachers you're doing it wrong. I just did it in my own classes. Um, and that worked. That's how the program grew so fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, but anyway, I yeah. think I just encourage all young mothers or everybody actually, you know, follow your gut. You know, if it doesn't make sense, it probably isn't yeah. sensible. Yeah. I mean, now we have a way to check it out. I mean, you can do a s- online search mm-hmm. and see if it's really true or not. In my era, that's what propelled me to go to the library. Spent mm-hmm. a lot right. of time in the library because 
if you just think about it, you know, the library was the old version of online search. It was the Google. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Google. <laughs> it's exactly. the pre Google Google. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, I really just love and I want to just reiterate and hang on this point for a minute about how important it is to just realize that a certain title or privilege that someone has over you does not mean that they are the final word and what is or isn't possible. Mm-hmm. And it's so easy, I think, for young people to get excited about an idea and then bring it up to somebody who they trust. And then have it just shot down and they give it up. That's right. And it's so easy for us to to promote people's dreams and give them that next step or that last little bit of encouragement. But it's also so easy for one word, one look, one little piece of something to kind of tear down the dreams of these kids that are looking mm-hmm. for us for encouragement. That's right. And that's you just said it beautifully. That's exactly one of the problems that mm-hmm. we face because these kids come up with very creative ideas and they're amazing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are shot down their ideas. And so that's why I have this global moonshots.org. And the goal of that is to promote what I call 20% time in the schools. That's the Google, uh, idea, right? Which I think your daughter had something to do with, right? That's right. That is the Google idea. It's the mm-hmm. same one. Yeah. So for 20% of the time in school, kids are given an opportunity to work on projects that they care about that might actually change the world. Yeah. That's only one day a week. That's one day a week. If yeah. you don't like doing it that way, it could be like one week a month. Sure. Or if you don't like doing it that way, you can figure it out hours per during individual class time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if kids just had the notion, just even the idea that they were creative and that they could spend mm-hmm. that time doing something creative, it would make a big difference to right. them personally right. and then to what they discovered to help our world. I think that's a really good uh, platform to see even mention of the idea because... I'm just thinking about when I was young because I, I have a little brother who is 17. And I see all of his teenage angst, or sorry, my little sister and my little brother as well. All the teenage angst just going inside of them, bubbling. Right. And a lot of that is just the fact that they feel like they're not taken seriously. And I remember right. feeling the exact same way. And I was always confused, like, what is up with that disconnect of parental and adolescent and not and there's just no bridge (laughs) the parents need to realize that they can be the best thing they can be is supportive Mm -hmm. and listen and to listen yeah 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 absolutely and i think uh, i'm just going to bring us to another point from your book because i Mm -hmm. think it fits with what we were just talking about you you mentioned how socially it can be i'm I'm going to quote here i'm quoting you (laughs) socially it can be challenging if you don't follow the rules and do what everyone around you is doing even when your kids don't fit in with those rules Mm -hmm. um, even when problems arise and this quote to me really stuck because it's this idea that you talked about about how you want to do something different you don't run around and tell everyone they're doing it wrong, Mm -hmm. but you do need to sort of be willing to shirk some of those social conventions and say, Hey, if I'm going to raise my kids differently, it means it may not look like what everybody else thinks is the right thing to do, or it may not look like what my classroom is a a traditional classroom is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And it takes some bravery to do that. Right. It takes some bravery because everybody is worried about what other people think. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the other thing I'd like to emphasize is worry about what what you think. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing because they did a survey of people on their deathbed and what they liked and disliked and regretted most in their lives. Yeah. And the number one thing people regretted was not doing what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. We don't want to end up like that. Yeah. Yeah, your your lifetime may only happen once, as far as I know. And if we don't use it for the best we can, we're, we're there's no do overs as as again, as far as I know. No as far as we know, yeah. It's hard to That's say true. actually what happens afterwards, but we we don't really know. So let's just yeah. assume nothing and use the time. We have <laughs> the best, statistics right? there, you're like, there's so many possibilities. Yeah, we I don't mean, know. <laughs> just don't know. Um, exactly. So. If you could boil down the number one parenting strategy, if you could just say, like, I'm going to have five minutes with one parent and I'm going to give them everything I can to move forward. Besides, go buy my book and read it if you're interested. What what would you what would be that nugget that you think would be most useful? Well, the nugget is that acronym I created. Mm, Okay, let's bring it back. Remind us the acronym. Trick is trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. So I created it to help everybody remember it. I also created it for myself so I could remember it too. (laughs) 
So it is really important. And it's just, it's simple. And it's easy to do. Um, it's sometimes scary to do because as I we talked about, you know, trusting and respecting a small mm-hmm. child, it's like, oh, is that really going to work out? <laughs> but, you know, if you don't trust and respect them, they're going to need you all the time. Mm-hmm. And then the more they need you, the less empowered they are because they can't do it without your help. And you don't want that to happen. You want them to be independent learners and independent thinkers. You want them to be morally um, independent. You want them to think on an ethical basis. Like, would that be a good thing for me to do? Is that going to hurt other people? Um, you know, because you don't want to allow that to happen bullying, for example, that is a terrible thing. And like, if I ever had kids that did that, I would sit them down. They had to write about how that person who was bullied might be feeling as a result of what they did. Mm -hmm. They had to write about it because I find that writing about it and reflecting is probably the most effective way Mm -hmm. of dealing with this Mm -hmm. kind of behavior as opposed to, you know, other punishment. I think it's, I find it ineffective and I just don't use it. And th- I'm really glad you brought this up because this is one of the, the points from the foreword that your kids wrote in your book about you as a mother and what it was like growing up with you and how you always brought them back to journaling. And this was like the journalist mm-hmm. in you. To reflect, yeah. But I think that's a really powerful takeaway that they clearly got the message of and you're still bringing it up now. And I'm just curious mm-hmm. in your mind, how valuable is that one habit of journaling and thinking about your your current or past and why is it you advocated it so hard for your kids it's so important because when you write about something you think about it and when you think about it and you think about all the repercussions that happen to other people or might be happening to you i mean it makes a huge difference and that's what what they're trying to do with punishment is to get people to think about what they did but punishment makes you so angry that then you don't think about it. You just hardly wait to get out of the situation. Mm. So what I'm trying to do is to make people think about how what they did might have had a negative impact on someone else or maybe on themselves. And is there a way for them to modify that behavior to make it better? And I find that journaling is the most effective thing of all. And so that's the only thing I ever use, by the way. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It stops the thoughts. doesn't make it feel so crazy. Take your time, write something. I agree. And and Clara is like a focusing process too. It really helps you focus what your thoughts are. And if you write it down and it sounds funny, you fix it, or you at least recognize that there's a flaw in what you're saying. And there's something very concrete about that, right? Just getting it down on paper. Well, but see, then you're listening to yourself. Write it. Mm, Yeah. Listening, you know, people don't listen to each other. Mm -hmm. What they do is they look like they're listening, but what they're really doing is waiting for you to be done so they can say what they think. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Sure. Gotta listen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's something that I'm, I'm we're just going to dwell on this for a couple of minutes. It's <laughs> such, such an important thing. I used to tell my students something along the lines of the greatest gift you can ever give someone is your attention. Yes. And there's something so powerful and known to us when someone gives us their full attention and really is just focused and listening and present. And it's such a powerful thing that I think goes a long way towards, you know, creating social bonds and creating the ability to collaborate and respect and have kindness towards other people. Mm -hmm. Because when you take that minute to listen, they become more, you know, personable, more real, more accessible. And all of a sudden you do too. Right. And it's such a simple thing that we can do. It doesn't cost us anything. It's mm-hmm. simple. That's why it's simple lessons. That's <laughs> why I love my results. job. Exactly. <laughs> I've listened to so exactly. many different stories. Exactly. 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 So, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So, where are we at here, Emily? You got any other any other questions? Because we are just about out of time. Can you believe how fast that hour goes by? That was an hour. Uh, just yeah. about. Yeah, <laughs> we're much. almost there. Oh about my god. Ten minutes left or so. I, I'm telling you, it always goes by so quick. But um, no, I mean, what I find really interesting is like what the, you have you brought up with morals and being a moral teacher, moral person, whether that be it, it completely covers the spectrum of personal and personal communication. Um, and so if I don't know if we really have the time, but if you can quickly go over kind of just some of the morals that you try to push with your children in the classrooms. 
Well, I think the main thing is, you know, do unto others. It's the golden rule Mm -hmm. as you want them to do unto you. And every single religion out there believes it, you know, Judaism, Christianity, even the Quran, everybody. And somehow in the midst of all these labeling, we forget about that. And I would like people to remember that, you know, that's a really, really important thing. And that's one of the gut reactions that is important is like, you want to treat people the way you wish that they would treat you. Right. And you want to teach the way you wish you would had been taught, which is one of the reasons why I do this mastery learning. So mm-hmm. you don't get a grade on your essay when you first turn it in, because if it's perfect, you don't need me. Right. 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 <laughs> so clearly you haven't pushed yourself if you don't need any feedback. yet. Right. right. So you get feedback and you get continue to get feedback on every revision. And then when it's pretty good, then you get a grade and the grades an A or B mm-hmm. and most of the time an A. Yeah. And you know, because some, they've worked to get to an A level, not because you're just giving them an A. That's right. They've revised sufficiently. And in mm-hmm. the process of revising, they've learned. Right. And then when you learn how to do something through revision and mastery, you don't forget as opposed to if you memorize something, all the statistics show that if you memorize something for a test, that after two weeks, you only remember 32 yeah, percent. It's almost completely gone, right? Uh, yeah. Well, after a year, it's five percent. Sure. And then after two years, you can't remember the name of the course. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's great. So I, I, I'm just curious because of this feedback process. I think a lot of teachers maybe have a hard time understanding how feedback works or why it's so valuable. And I'm hearing you give a very like thoughtful, progressive f- way of approaching feedback. And I'm just wondering if you if you have a student turn in a first draft, I'm assuming you're probably not looking at punctuation and grammar at that point, and you're really trying to help them get substantive and you kind of get closer and closer to punctuation and grammar near the last draft? Or? That's right. No, so the first part is like substantive. It's organization. It's the ideas. It's like, what are you trying to tell your reader? And, you know, how have you organized it? And do you have any support? Where's your support? I don't see the support. It's like, you can't just say the same thing repeatedly over and over again, which is what they think of support. As. Right. It's like, nope. <laughs> doesn't work. You don't have to go out and get some support. So just learning that concept of trying to figure out like what it is that's going to support their statement. Right. It's a big deal for them. Right. But then when you do it in writing, then you do it in life and you yeah. do it and you're, you're like, oh, does that make sense? Oh, let me see if I can really document that. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we're doing enough of that. I agree. I agree. And, and it is it is a process of revision and refinement and seeking input. And I think that's something a lot of people are missing on a, on a larger scale is just the value of being vulnerable enough to ask for input and feedback and the chance to grow. Well, they're afraid to ask for input because they're afraid it's going to impact their grade. Right. Right. So let's get rid of the grade stuff. You know, how about just learning so that you can get better and then you get the grade at the end. This is a novel is an idea. It's a, it sounds so strange that that is a thing that people should be doing, even though it's so obvious that is exactly what learning should be about. Right. That's right. And it's, it's so it's, freaked out about that grade that you can barely learn. Right. Right. And, and some of my favorite classes have been ones where the teacher says something along the lines like you're going to get an A unless you don't do the work and everybody's going to try their best. And then let's just let that off the, be off the table so we can more focus on what matters. Yes, that's right. Focus yeah. on what matters in, in learning and doing it. So Yeah, yeah. Well, Esther, I, our time is basically over here. Well, so this is Esther you. Wojcicki. Did I say Wojcicki. right? Wojcicki. Wojcicki. Okay. Esther Wojcicki. And she is a teacher at Palo Alto High School and has been doing journalism classes. I can't read that at all, Emily. She, Emily's trying to hand me a sign over the back. Um, but and you can hop on the mic and tell us too, Emily. But we are uh, we are here sitting and talking with Esther Wojcicki, who has written a book. What was the name of that book again, Emily? Uh, Emily can't do anything back there. Tell us the name of your book again, Esther. How to raise successful people: simple lessons for radical results. And it's available on Amazon in the hard copy, in the Audible version, and in a Kindle. And oh, I would guess in a few months or however long it takes them, it will be available in paperback. But uh, I think right now it just came out. It's only a week and two days old. Oh, that's so exciting! Oh my <laughs> gosh. Okay, so I have my own copy, and I am reading. 
reading it right now. I'm really enjoying it. If you are interested, you can go pick up your copy as well. I'm sure Esther would love to hear from you on any. Are you on any of the social medias, or is there any way people could reach out to you? Twitter, you can... Esther Wojcicki at Twitter. I'm okay. At LinkedIn. Okay. I'm on Facebook. There it is. Um, so you can look her up on all the major social medias, and if you wanted to reach out, she might be willing to get back to you as well. She's a very, very nice guest. We had such a good time talking with you. Well, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Appreciate being invited. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So this is Ben Woodford here with Modern Education. We are signing off one more week here in the studio with another live interview. We come back every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. for your commute home here on 90.1 KZSU Stanford.